next. I think we are online. Excellent. All right. Good. Good evening. Good afternoon. And good morning, guys. Um, today, um, we are very lucky to chat to one good friend of mine, um, David Glesbrook. Um, he's a people photographer, like shooting lots of portraits between Monday to Friday. But what's really, uh, you guys already seen this. What really um, attracts him lots of attention and is that he's a, a great macro photographer. So he's going to share with lots of his secrets of using lighting and other accessories uh, doing his macros, right? Uh, Indeed. For the last couple of years, I almost watched him getting gold. Uh, it's like so easy, like gold is dropping out of his pocket <laughs> uh, in AIPP as well as in the other international sort of competitions. He's also an international judge with AIPP at um, NZIPP as well as a couple of uh, other comp international competitions. So I'm sitting here really excited and as excited as you guys are. And uh, let's see what David can bring to us. Yeah, good evening, everyone. I uh, hope you're yeah. all well. Uh, as Eri said, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from around the world. Uh, a special hello to our Victorian friends in lockdown in this uh, COVID times and a few people that I know are tuning in from across the ditch there in New Zealand. Uh, as Aries mentioned, I uh, yeah had the joy of uh, judging the nature side of things as well as a few other things for NZIP uh, only last week or two. So that was an awesome competition. They do some fantastic work. Um, but as Aries mentioned, you know, I do... Um, portrait or a, a people photographer Monday to Friday, but macro, uh, landscape, astro, these are the sorts of things that I really get into at a personal level. Um, and to, so tonight I'm going to take you through an introduction to macro um, and give you just a few tips and tricks and how I, how I get some of these shots that I'm going to share with you. Um, so uh, you may not know, but I live in the Blue Mountains, which is a world heritage, well, Listed National Park. I live on the side of it. I don't actually live in the park, you know. I'm not Yogi Bear, but um, but um, yeah. So I live close to that, and that's a World Heritage Listed National Park. It's about 90 minutes west of Sydney, and it's uh, a really good uh, hunting ground uh, to go find uh, subjects to shoot. Only with my camera, of course, you know. So um, as well as that, I only live about one row of houses off the bush there, and so lots of these animals and insects visit my backyard which makes it really awesome for finding uh, subjects there. But of course, we mentioned macro, and so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the gear, et cetera. Um, of course, macro is a very loose term for anything from close-up photography. You'll see some lenses that mention that they may be a regular zoom lens, but they also have a macro feature on them. Regularly though, that's only sort of a uh, one to two or one to three sort of ratio. And what macro is by clinical definition, a one to one. So where the object that you're seeing is um, focused at the same size on your sensor, one to one, that's macro. Anything else above that is sort of close up. Uh, good evening to Hawaii. And uh, anything past that, probably two, three, four, five times, even further up is um, my micro photography. So you're familiar with like the Canon lenses, the MPE 65 or something like that. That's quite a popular macro or micro lens. So there's a couple of ways to get into this because people go, well, I don't want to go and buy all that gear kind of business, you know. Um, you can start by going in and buying a fit on like a, a diopter. This is a bit like a, this is a bit, just a lens that clips straight on the front of your camera and it will, it will give you some sort of uh, increased magnification. So that's the, that, that's the entry level way to sort of get in. The next way to get in, is by a set of extension tubes. You can see that these come, there's a stack of three here and depending on what sort of strength you sort of want there. Oh, sorry, the super cheapest way. I mean, it's the super cheapest way. That's actually a reversing ring. So it looks like a bit like a, looks a little bit like the thin wedge uh, here of this particular uh, uh, extension tube, but what it allows, it actually screws on the front of your lens and can go backwards, allows the, to mount the lens then backwards onto the body. So you'll find that that's a, that's a cheap way. But of course then people go and go, well, look, you know, uh, then it's into macro lenses, of course, and I'm a big fan of the, uh, I, I've used Nikon, I've used Sigma, but my, but my tried and trusted has been my Tamron 90 mil. It's been everywhere with me. I, I shot it early days, then I left it, I've come back to it. That's the sort of thing, you know, um, that gets on there. So there's lots of sort of bits and pieces in terms of the, the optics and all that, but you need some way of sort of, uh, getting this, you know. Um, the next thing, of course, you need is uh, a good tripod because your uh, 
don't get me wrong, you can handhold shoot, and I'll give you some techniques for that later. But initially, you'll find that unless you've got a really st steady sort of, you know, sniper-like sort of shot here, you, you need a good tripod to sort of lock this down. Um, and something that may be able to connect the camera to the tripod, here's my camera, and you might recognise this little orange bracket. That's very synonymous with the three-legged thing. But that's my L bracket, and I find an L bracket's a good, really good way of locking that down. It's got to be stable. The reason it's got to be stable is because the depth of field is so shallow in, in macro. You think about what you have, like when you're shooting a portrait and when you've got, a, you know, a 10 centimetres, 20 centimetres, uh, this is now right down to millimetres of focus, yeah? So that's why it can be in a focus, out of focus, in, a fo in focus, out of focus. So um, that's pretty important. Uh, so yeah, so we load up, uh, we load that up. Now, one one tip, you know, if you go, look, I'm not going to go and spend all this money on this. One thing that I would do, or I would say, in terms of trying to achieve focus, and I'm only talking about single shot tonight because we can talk about focus stacking and we can talk about other programs and software that go with it, but that's really disappearing down the wormhole kind of business. We're going to keep it at sort of the the entry level here tonight. One tip that I would give you is turn your uh, audible focus or on okay so when you when you achieve focus and your camera goes beep, beep, and it says says that what you can actually do is go to manual focus on your on your macro and then you just sort of lean into the subject and you're here and it'll go beep, beep, and then you can take the shot you don't need to watch for your little focus confirmation down here because sometimes you've got to look down the bottom you know left or right corner of your lens uh, your viewfinder there to be able to see the focus confirmation so this way then if you're just hand holding and you and you you've got a good sniper hold um, which I have had, you know, the older I get, the less, I, the less good I am. That's what they sort of say, isn't it? You know, then, uh, then good evening, Tasmania. Um, <laughs> we see, uh, we, this is just one of those things. So yeah, I found that really helpful and I'll show you a shot later on that I've got, but how about we go to a video there, Aries, because what we'll sure. do, we'll go to, we'll, we'll go to a forest video. This gives you a little bit of a clip and gives you an idea about one of my local hunting grounds and where I go. Okay. Yes, master. Which one I'm going? Uh, which one? Are we so you're going to go to forest. We'll go to forest. Yes, okay. Let's go for forest. Indiana, David. Indiana. Indiana, David Glassbrook Jones himself <laughs> in flesh, in flesh, in the forest. Here we go. So this is a local grove of trees that I go down sometimes. Uh, it's only about five minutes from home. Um, particularly this time of year because it's winter here. Well, actually, today is only the second day of spring here, but. Here I am, um, I've got my AD200 out and I've got a little softbox on, which is a really handy little uh, gizmo there for being really portable. But a, a grove of trees here that I go, and sometimes if I can't find insects, like you wouldn't expect to find them in winter, of course, they, they're starting to only just come out now in little flowers. Here's a little composition I found of just some tight, um, tight vines running around a tree. One of my oh favorite my little things for macro. <laughs> it looks unstable, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. That's that's my snoot. Yeah. I've got one of one oh, of several okay. snoots, that little little Godox snoot there that goes on the front. I've got a couple of them here. Um that's just really for restricting that light, of course. And I'll show you um some things here in terms of just uh where I've used them in terms of shots oh, here. Nice. So see that, like um I'll show you once we've finished this clip, which I think we have. Let me yep. just sort of see if I can run through Aries. Go to my, can you go to my screen? Yeah, you, your screen's on. Have a look. Yep. okay, there we are. Okay. So what I want to show you in that clip there, that's just the scene that I saw. Um, and what I liked about this was the texture. I like these uh, vines running the diagonal across it because that's good compositionally. Diagonals are always quite powerful in composition. It doesn't matter whether you're doing um, macro photography, whether we're doing portraits, whether we're doing architecture, whatever we're doing. Um, Diagonals are always good. But anyway, you see this, this is just ambient light, okay? Um, and let's just have a little look, see if I can pop my, oh, sorry, my settings didn't come to translate through on this on this batch. Um, let me just sort of see, I'm gonna see if we've still got them here. No, it didn't come through. But I can tell you it was an overcast day and I think I was about ISO 1600, okay? Because that's what I had to do as far as um, capturing this particular one. And I think it's pretty flat and not, not particularly, um, not particularly good, but uh, if we come back here now, what I did, you saw that little snoot that I, uh, the little snoot that I popped on the front of the AD200 with a bear bulb. This then focused that light right on that spot, uh, gave me some direction. You'll see that you can tell by the lighting angle here that I've sort of come from uh, top left here. Oh, what's going on there? Somebody else is running around here in the system there. Um, it's gremlins. And now I've got some lighting angle, so I can create some texture uh, in the shadows in here. 
you'll be able to sort of see. So that's why I've taken control here. So I can talk about all this gear, and I'm gonna give you gear because gear is really important, but this is part of the gear too. You know, this is this is taking control of life. And like anything that you do, macro photography is really one of those things where um, where you just think about it like shooting a portrait, like shooting something else. Look at the texture in that. Like that's all, look like how sharp that is. There's that much texture. The lighting also really helps uh, sink that in. So. I can now shoot down at ISO 100. I may have even met at ISO 64 because that's the native ISO on um, the Nikon D850. That's what I shoot there. So what let's have a look. Did you use? Because Tim, uh, Tim Wolf here says his favorite is uh, 100 macro. I mean, yeah. Okay. Hey, cinema. Tim. Yep. I know Tim. G'day, mate. Long time no see. But, mate, yeah, Canon macro. Uh, yeah, I believe it's great, but I haven't sort of been in the Canon stables there for a, a long time. Uh, I'm using the the Camera on 90. I know the Nikon 105 is fabulous. I'm sure there's others. As I said, I've had to play with uh, some of the Sigma lenses as well. Um, mm -hmm. I used to have a Sigma 150. I've just found that um, I guess I'm at the 90 mil there because it shoots, suits my purposes uh, for what I do the whole, most of the time. The 150 and those lenses are a hulking lens. You know, they're a 2.8 lens, so they're a, a big piece of glass. When you've got to carry it around through the field, it's one of those things a bit like, you know, you're trying to get the best gear at the right weight you know, and uh, you, you sort of work your kit out there. So, yeah, anyway, that's uh, that's how we go there. Why don't we go through and just have a look at uh, also um, Forest One there, Aries. And because okay, that, sure. that'll follow on there. Yep. I'll have one, a little talk through sec. that. Let me have a little sip of water here. Yep. Yeah, so actually this is, oh, here it is. Your garden's you know, pretty big, there. mate. My what? Sorry. Your garden. Your backyard. My garden. <laughs> yeah. Your backyard. Uh, this yeah. is me. I, I I um I really enjoy these places. There, are, there's a st big stand of blue gums out here, as well as turpentines. Turpentines, of course, are great wood for making jetties. They're well submerged sort of water. Uh, here I am looking at some textures here. I always find if I can't find insects, I generally sort of start going for textures, patinas. I'm looking here at this sort of burnt tree, the lichens that happen here. And it can make for some, you know, some really good abstract sort of photography. Um, I'm a self-confessed tree hugger, so here I am, and I'm probably going to give it a little, uh, a little handshake and say hello. But you know, it's uh, me just poking around through the, and, and it's always just it's experimentation. It's looking here, and I, and I find something before I get my kit out. I'm normally shooting sort of hands-free here because I'm just testing the composition, you know, and until you sort of start locking it down on tripods and, and getting lighting gear out. I'm just, I'm talking my way through here with our, our photographer, uh, sorry, our videographer there. I'm looking at, you know, uh, skeleton leaves. They're naturally found skeleton leaves. I'm going to show us some uh, bits and pieces here on a, on a um, skeleton leaf. So why don't I actually come back? Uh, let's see. So I was talking about... I was talking about uh, some gear and the lighting. Well, I'm going to show you some leaves here that I have shot. What was what was a, a little bit problematic for this time of year, of course, was that, as I said, middle of winter, so trying to find some insects uh, in nature uh, to photograph this time of year was a little bit of a challenge, but I've got some ones here that I'll show you, and I'll show you some uh, leaves that were shot there. But, um, yeah, anyway, let's go and have a little look. I'm going to take you through to... What I think we'll do then also, Aries, because I think it'd be a good intro, is they can sort of see this and then we can show them the the, uh, the photos, is the um, leaf one. Here's a, here's a quick question for our uh, Cabrillo. Oh, sure. Yep. You got the question? Yeah. Did, can you see it? On the, on no, the right? I, I'd it's love to. On, on, oh. on the right, it's off the comments. Yep. Yeah. It's like I'd love to see more images shooting using that snoot. Oh, the, the snoot. Yes, yes, hmm. yes, yes, absolutely. So there is – so if we go to Leaf One there, Aries, uh, you'll see um, there is some images there, and I'm going to show them then some snoot images um, out of that scene there. So if we have a look at the video there that um, – Okay. All right. Give me one sec. Let me just sure. get a Leaf One. Let me share – Aries is driving or, the videos there. Yeah, or yeah. you can just do it on the, you know, on on the road. To be honest, do it on the road. When, when in the road, whenever you are ready to share, just share okay. and tell them. Okay. Yeah, okay. we don't have to. 
uh, to break your your workflow. Does it make sense? <laughs> okay. We will share that so, later. Maybe let's just share them later whenever you know you are um we move there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. So let's have a look here. So okay. Well, we were asking, I, and I I can show some snoot images here. So this is this is um. I go that, that forest there. I go foraging for leaves in there. And I'm looking for skeleton leaves, what was commonly known as a skeleton leaf. This is a leaf that is part way through decomposition. Um, you can see a bit of cotton that's hanging off the top here. So I, I, I hang these up and I have a black fabric background. But this is just the light as it falls. It's actually, I'm shooting on my out in my kitchen living room area out here. And this is just the light that falls on it. Pretty unattractive kind of lighting. Um, but it gives you just an idea about how it's sort of set up there. Um, then what I do is if I go to flash, we get a very oh. different result straight away. Look at that. Yeah. Okay? I've cleaned up that cool. background. The black plays along nicely because, of course, it gives us that. It gives us some – Look at uh, have a look at the texture in on this. Yeah, so the lighting is really sort of playing and, and bringing those textures out. I've warmed it up here a bit, you know. but at the moment, I've actually just um, I, I've got I haven't really given the lighting direction. But here, here is when I pop a snoot on. I can now oh. I can now I can now give it much more. I can really bring out each of the folds and much more texture. And you can sort of see in here, like if you look along here, you can see how I'm bringing out shape and I'm bringing out a whole lot of texture here. Um, so yeah, that's a sample of um, bringing the light down and being very broad. And then bringing it right down onto the subject. Yeah. Um, here we also. Here's another example. So this is another. This is another skeleton leaf. You have a look in here. Have a look at the texture in on that. Oh. Really, really fine details. Yeah. Look at the detail here. This is a. Mm. As I say this is just a, a Tamron here. What I actually did here is I. Oh, that's eighty-two hundred too. No, that's a ninety ninety. 90 mil Tamron. Okay. Oh, 90, 90 mil, mil Tamron. No, I was saying the light, 8200. Oh, the light. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, where are we going there? Um, yeah. No, these are the 8200s. 8200s. 80, okay. All these shots at 8200s. I have got yeah. some 300 shots there I'm going to show you in a while but where I needed a much bigger light source. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is, yeah, 8200. Now, I've actually got two lights yeah. going here. I've actually got one coming over top. Uh, so it's coming down here, d down uh, overhead, and I've got another one hitting this side right here. So I've actually got two AD two hundred sort of doing this, both with snoots, because I want to be able to be able to control each of these pieces of lighting here. Um, and of course, I'm just firing it off my uh, trigger that I can control from my camera, which is really important because rather than having to get up high, if it was, let's say, this wasn't a leaf, let's say this was an insect or something like that, they're really sensitive to all that. Uh, all that movement there. So yeah, you've seen a, uh, a couple of the leaf things. What uh, can we play that leaf one there, Aries? And they'll, they'll sort of see sure. just some of the some of that set up there. So here it is. As I said, it said just hanging in situ. You can see here how it isn't. I'm shooting tethered. There was that shot you saw before with the just the the ambient lighting. And here it is. You can see I've got one of those snoots there. I had that little silver one here. Um, they also sell that. Actually, it's funny. They sell the silver one and they sell this one that comes in a kit. So you can get two of them there. Obviously, one's a silver, a little bit tighter. Um, and we'll sort of see. So I, I, I'm shooting tethered here because I get, to, I get to review the image nice and large here on the screen. You can see the laptop sitting there on the bench. Um, Fancy. Yeah, well, there the, the you can sort of yeah. see because you know what it's like to review the image. You yeah. know, if you, uh, it's a way and, easier than on, on, on the laptop to, you know. For sure, to, for sure. And this comes along from, you know, I say I photograph people and I photograph some commercial jobs sometimes in studios, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, of course, when you're trying to review critical sharpness then yeah. um, and also get the feel for it, then here, then uh, that's how it comes there. So, yeah, you can sort of see that I'm using a little boom stand. You can see the boom stand over the back, which is sort of behind the AD200 there. That's actually serving as holding the bit of cotton that's holding the, the end of the leaf there. And the leaf sort of mm -hmm. uh, dangles there. And, of course, that little bit of cotton is easy to get rid of uh, in post. And um, you'll see that uh, I've mounted the AD200 there on a little um, uh, JB Gorilla Pod. I find those excellent for holding the AD200s. I can hang them in trees. I can hang them off the back of chairs. Um, they're a 
uh, I, I get my, of course, being in Australia, I've got mine here locally and the local Australian distributor is KL, but of course, globally, I, I would look it up. JB is one of those global brands, you know, they're awesome. So yeah, you can sort of see there that uh, one of these things. I'll, I'll go back to my screen here, um, Aries, and uh, sure. just have a look because I've got an, I, I, I've, here's another texture shot that just sort of came along. I didn't shoot this one the other day. This is one I just found when I was digging through um, my uh, archive here. This is, but again, what I've done here is I've actually, I've actually got two, oh, sorry, I've actually got, only got one light. I've lit from the front side here and the back side is actually a window. So there's some techniques here that you can use to sort of use backlight. If you can use some daylight, but you can use it, use your flash that you've got. This is just a way of sort of, uh, way of getting in here. Um, yeah, let's have a look here. So yeah, brilliant, cool, cool textures, great. Okay. What I'm going to show you, let me sort of see. Why don't we go? One of the really fun things I'm actually going to go through, and one of the things that we did the other day was um, when your videographer was out, Aries, is we went and played with some bubble photography because that's one of the things that I know some audiences now are going into um, fall or autumn, our North American, Northern Hemisphere uh, audiences going in there. And our southern hemisphere, we're going into spring. Yay. Today was just an absolute gorgeous day here. And if you weren't in here tonight watching this, you'd probably be outside doing some uh, astrophotography. The moon is looking awesome outside tonight. But stay with us. Um, I'm going to show you, we're going to go to some bubble photography. And I'm going to show you how um, how, I, how we did some bubbles. So can we, can we run the little bubble video there, Aries? Of course. Please. Um, and then yep. I can have a sure. sip of water because I I, uh, I dry out pretty quick talking so quick. Sometimes I Me feel too. like I'm falling away. Did you notice how I keep on drinking? Yeah. The same here. Okay. Um, me. So this one here features uh, in the sorry, bubble photography. One second. You're all right, mate. I can. I'm just sort of doing a, a little prelude to this bubble. This is bubble. This one? So, yeah, that's it. Yeah. So you can see I've got an AD 300 there on the top because I need a fair amount of light, and I've got an 85-centimetre uh, white softbox on top. That little jar I'm holding, I'm going to tell you all about that. That's a secret sauce that I use to make some bubbles. Um, lots of uh, photographers that try this kind of stuff, is uh, it's their secret recipe. You can see here I'm actually blowing a bubble up um, with my extended straw and have a little look at this you'll see that when we get around here i'm um, photographing these bubbles now that's just soap what you're seeing there all those awesome awesome colors is just soap and you have a look at this and you'll see within this series here that the soap changes over time it's a amazing sort of you, you don't never really sort of see and that's what i i guess i really enjoy about macro is sometimes that you oh. see things yeah look at that you're seeing things at a macro level that you just sort of think, oh yeah, I, I wash my soap dishes up in the sink each night, or I, or I shoot that fly away, you know, and I, and what do you see? You don't see much, so, but at a macro level, of course, it takes us into this world. Um, so let's just have a little look at this. Look at, yeah, I think that's just mesmerizing. Like I, I feel like I should have some sort of, you know, transcendental music on while I'm sort of listening to this. It's this. Um, and all I did then is I just gave a little blow with the straw and it moves it around and changes it all. So I'm going to take you through a whole series of photos here, tell you how that's done, because I think this is, was a really good sort of COVID style. Look at the textures oh. and colours you get out of this. It's so psychedelic, man. It's so 60s or something like that, you know. It's, uh, um, and that's just a lens cap I put the solution in. A little back, of the back, back, back lens cap there kind of business. Blow that up. Mm. I've got my macro on there. I've actually got a stack of extension tubes because I wanted to get in that close to those textures. Yeah. And it's almost like 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 a fingerprint. No no two bubbles are the same. Um, and particularly when you change your uh, mixtures up. And I'll, I'll tell you about that because I think that's something that's just so fascinating. And I've got some really big ideas about how I'm going to sort of use these going forward, uh, um, you know, for some images that i am uh, been experimenting with. I've been out... Uh, let me go here. Now, so here, that little syringe, I'm actually dropping drips of dishwashing soap onto it. This is actually a picture of a bubble degrading. 
but look now it's got like a rusty pantino a real sort of um mm. texture to it so anyway okay so if we go back to my screen here um yeah. thanks i'll pop this one up but what i'm showing you here you saw so that the premise of the bubble the the bubble photography here is this uh, uh it's not my sun-dried tomatoes it's a jar that was housed sun-dried tomatoes now it's got this little solution in it it's got a uh got something oh, in there so that's uh, all right. can can we can we can we share again dave so i'll just enlarge you well, sure you, 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 see. okay sure sure no i i'm only just showing you a, a solution in a, in a jar a brown sort of sticky solution in a jar you can see there's a syringe inside mm -hmm. it what that is it's a mixture of water dishwashing soap and glycerin okay glycerin is something that's normally used in in this and i've got actually another use for, use for glycerin down the track here uh i'm going to show you here so the glycerin uh helps hold the stability of the bubble okay generally the um mixture a, go a good rule of thumb to start with when you're going to make your mixture up if you're going to have a crack at this i start with uh six parts water two parts uh two parts dishwashing liquid one part glycerin okay so if you start with that now other people go and put additives into this they go and put sometimes i've tried syrups sugary syrups there um because what we're trying to do is try and make a stable bubble because sometimes you know you blow a bubble as a kid and it could go up and pop and up and pop i've seen uh mixtures that good where the bubble will hang around four five six minutes yeah and this allows you to sort of play with this um you saw when in the video there with the bubble moved really quick um it moved quick that was just because i had straw and i blew on it and i was just trying to rotate the bubble a little bit yeah but i think uh, in terms of now the idea though the way i the way i lit that is you saw my very high tech light stand was actually just four drinking glasses they're only about so big because what i actually did is i sat my 85 centimeter softbox on the top there and I had my AD300 in the top. And what it did is it means that the softbox is only sitting about this far off the off the bubble. Now, the important bit here is what you're actually seeing here in terms of the colour when you see these images is you're actually seeing the reflection of the softbox because normally a bubble is highly translucent. Of course, the black background, I had a bit of black fabric out the back of the box, softbox. But what gives us the highly saturated colours is the white of the softbox that's why you need such a light, large light source straight over the top and it being so close a bit like portraiture sometimes you've got to get your light source really really close just out of frame and that's what it and this is this is what it does so if you only had like a a speed light or something like that at the moment a v1 or something like that you'd find that you'd almost get like a, a catch light on it it'd look like when you're photographing somebody's face and you get like a little catch light in the eye so now our softbox is that much larger than our subject and so this gives us um gives us this now um so let me just run you through a, 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 a i'm, I'm going to flick, just flick through a can they see my screen at the moment there aries yeah sure okay just give me one sec yep here we go okay this is all the same soap mixture so i haven't changed the mixture up here crazy 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 designs now what i the next shot here is i i actually popped in i popped on my extension tubes onto my macro and i got in tight and this is sort of the this is on the bubble wall pattern here so you can appreciate though that the the bubble wall is a is a curved sort of surface and i'm sort of focusing right here on the middle so that the tops are out of focus the bottom's out of focus but we've got enough in here to sort of uh keep us entertained um and so if it gets a bit boring, you know, you just give it a little blow and it changes and it, and it keeps changing. And so, yeah, um, my mind starts going lots of places with this areas and I, I've got some, hopefully some exciting st stuff to sort of bring in the future. This is what a bubble looks like when it's starting to degrade. So the, the, the soaps actually start falling out of the, the dome structure. And this is an indication that the bub bubble's gonna pop soon. Um, but nonetheless, I think still really interesting uh, textures uh, and uh, look at it here and this to me almost feels like it's rusty like a rusty steel ball or something of that nature yeah mm. so 
so I, so to go back over, I've got a, as I said, a softbox, an umbrella softbox, the AD, the um, ADS uh, 85W is what I've got here. Um, I've only got a single um, single piece of diffusion in it. You can put double diffusion in it, but the idea is to try and get a fair bit of light through here and an AD300 here on the top because this gives me a lot of light. Now, sometimes we need a lot of light in macro. I've had the snoots on there, which I was talking about earlier, where I'm just being very precise and very petite as far as where I'm placing the light. But uh, at other times, I need, a, I need a fair amount of light. And this is, of course, extension tubes also help suck up a bit of light as well. So this is when you, when you need more. Um, so let's sort of see. I'm going to show you. I'm going to flick up here another shot here where I needed a lot of light. Uh, let me come up here. This is out in my garden. And this is just a, a fly that happened to be just hanging out there in the garden. But I had a uh, lower two times macro lens on here. Uh, this thing is completely manual, uh, no contacts, anything like that. But it can also focus down to, I, I got this within. Um, centimeters of this fly like re really close now of course on the, the likes of the tamarons and the cannons and all those kinds of things that we mentioned earlier they've got like 30 centimeters minimum focus the extension tubes get you closer but when you're that close to it um on a manual lens and you may also have extension tubes on it needs a lot of light now i actually shot this over the top with uh, the ad 300 and it was bare bulb over the top so no modifiers on this but it's, sh it's shaped well enough, it's circular, it sits in your hand, it's got a little mount there on the bottom that, that I could just hold it up straight over the top. And this is why the light though, sort of the, the reflection here on it, sorry, I'm pointing with my finger and I'm sure nobody can see my me gesticulating at the screen there with uh, that. But you can see these 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 highlights on the fly here. To me, they it's believable that it could have it could have been like a kind of sunlight. So sometimes the sunlight is really specular as well. So. This is a, a good example of, of that. So, and I find that the AD 200 and 300 are really good, not only for macro, but for a lot of things. Like I, I, I mentioned about pe being people photographer. I, I photographed preschoolers with it last week. They're very, it's very, um, I like utility being in my gear and it, it does um, a, a great job there. So, um, so. Let me tell you a few tips. I'm sort of a bit all over the place. My brain sort of ping pongs around here a little. I'm going to show, tell you how I get close to these creatures because some people sort of go, well, how do you get close to these guys? Like I'll, I'll put up another picture. And, um, like Dave, I'm just curious. With a previous image, mm. right, you shot mm. um, with the fly ones. Uh, what sort yeah, of um, f-stops and ISO we are looking at and how much power did you use out of 8300? Okay. So out of an 8300, uh there i would have been because i'm i'm so close with this okay so mm. if we with this lens i would have been about f16 okay okay i'm trying to okay but f16 that close to fly would only translate to um a mil mil and a half depth of field mm -hmm. yeah um because we're, we're, we're at uh we're at double size there so so mm -hmm. therefore, and of course, at F16, I need a lot of light, yeah? So mm -hmm. I was probably about half power or so on the okay. AD300. But mm -hmm. the reason I also want to, uh, and the reason I prefer that over the 200 is because if I want to take two quick shots or something like that, bang, bang, because sometimes the fly, the flies get jittery and they move this way and they move that way. They sort of don't respond terribly well to my verbal instruction. So I've just got to be very opportunistic in terms of when I want to take a couple of quick shots. And the recycle time is generally quick enough where I can go bang, bang, bang bang you know and i'm getting the i'm getting shots out straight away because sometimes the fly dances around moves around i've got to be able to tap tap wait tap tap and, and keep firing this way yeah so um as opposed to i also have an ad 600 but i can't hand hold that thing you know that's that, that you know and of course there's a 1200 but those things are just you know they're not <laughs> i haven't seen them used for macros yet aries maybe one of these days we can find an application for it hey mate <laughs> but uh yeah so that, that, and, and as I said, that that's bare bulb. That's and I've lit pretty much the whole scene. Um, I've tilted it probably forward toward me here a bit because you'll see here in the back, 
I've got this this area yeah, here. I was wondering how did you you know if you don't have grade or any modifiers, how did you, mm. you know, avoid to sometimes okay. So what I sometimes do with with the light, um, mm. let me let me grab one here. I've actually got a two hundred here, but I'll show you. Sometimes yeah. what I do is actually use, I use my hand a little bit as a so if I hold it like this, uh, let's see, like that, my hand becomes yeah. my hand becomes a, a scrim, mm. yeah. So uh, mm. for those who uh, don't know, a scrim is like a flag. It's a way of shielding some of the light off the back. Mm. Um, so sometimes I, I, I can hold like this. But with this this kind of th so thing like this, easily hand-holdable, as is the AD300, yeah? Mm. Um, but I let want me to just address. Let me just address some questions here. I'm not sure, sure. we can answer those questions, but uh, let's still chat about it. Yeah, uh, there was a question. Is Godox going to design good tripods for us? I'm sorry, mate. We have. I don't think I have. We have any idea about that. But uh, if there's any update, we will let you know. Easy. Um, yeah. I saw Mario that is asking. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh no! I was going to. I was going to. I was going to interject. Apparently they're releasing microphones there now, Aries. I just saw them releasing microphones. Yeah, so. I just I right. just noticed that. No, 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 yeah, no tripod oh, because microphones so far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but who knows? Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next <laughs> month. I don't know. But uh, I have no information or no source. I'm sorry, Sidesh. I cannot answer that question. Do you need to play with zoom function of the speed light. So with AD300 and AD200, they are more like a traditional strobe lights they are not speed lights so they are much more powerful they do not come with zoom function but you can use um modifiers like you know softbox long reflector like how you do with a bigger lights bigger boys uh, mm. to modify your zoom functions yeah yeah okay so yeah and that's just one of those things i mean not only zoom function is also when you're trying to throw your light a whole lot further as well so mm. uh, and of course in macro we're, it's sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat here kind of thing, you know, where mm. we're in nice and close. Um, I'm going to show you just a few images here, and I'm going to talk my way through them, sure. um, of images um, that are caught in my backyard. Normally, uh, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you the stories about these kind of thing because people want to know how these are, how these are caught. Um, and actually, we've got a little bit of... Uh, it's interesting on some of these JPEGs here that I've put in this catalog here, Aries, I, I get some of the metadata mm -hmm. and some of them I don't. But anyway, um, so this fellow here is um, called X-Wing. He's a dragonfly that has just uh, landed out here in the backyard. I was going to tell you how to approach these guys. So I'll tell you maybe piece by piece here because there's techniques for each of these and you've got to get to know these animals' behaviour. You know? It's a bit like I mentioned before that I, I photographed preschoolers last week. Well, you can see I'm a fairly large fellow. I've got a deep voice. I can't just walk up to them and go, hi, kids, smile kind of thing, you know, because they're going <laughs> to they're gonna cry, ooh, run away. In the same way this dragonfly would take off if I just ran up to it kind of thing, you know. So yeah. you've got to approach um, the way I would say to approach insects in general. If you if you see something and you want to get to it, one you walk very softly. So you're trying to walk stealth. You, your feet don't create vibration. Um, you're walking like a, a ninja, so to speak, because the vibration they pick up the vibration, they take off. If your shadow was to cross over it, because this is this was shot during uh, the daylight. Let me say I, I had some of my metadata here. You can see here that I shot this a while ago, but uh, it was shot, oh, the, I don't think the date's right there, but it was shot at half past one in the afternoon. So um, if my shadow crosses over this as well, so don't let your shadow cross your subject, okay? So that's that's two tips. Dragonflies as well, so you get to know your subject, often like to be close to a source of water as well. So that's why they hang around sides of dams and ponds and creeks and all this kind of business. We happen to have a bird bath that's not far away, and I believe that's sort of their, their local haunts. So here I've got just one single light source. We can see the light coming from the top left. They are handheld, okay, over the top. I like to, on my AD200, if I want to soften my light, I've got just a generic no-name little softbox right here that I put on the side here. Um, I'm sure Aries will fill us in there if uh, the Godox have got something like that. But in my time there, they did have that. And all I did was I stuck a couple of little bits of Velcro on the side of my AD200. And I can hand hold. Wait, let me now, let me let me go go closer and have a look. Yep. Sure. Okay. So yeah. on the side there, see that a couple of little bits of yep. Velcro. I've just popped on the side there, yeah. and then on the inside of that soft box, I've got the other side of the the Velcro, and that's a really little lightweight handheld soft box I've got there now. Yeah. 
so I can go around here. So I've ha I've handheld this at about 10 o'clock in my left hand over the top here. You can see where the catch light is sort of on the on the dragonfly's eye here. And you can see I've used my trusted trusty Tamron 90 mil. Uh, as I said, it's been all over the place here with me. And shooting at 160th of a second at ISO 400, so I'm guessing it must have been a fairly sort of cloudy day actually because of that, that, that kind of setting at half past one in the afternoon. But I've got the darker background because my – uh, ambient light has obviously needed a an exposure that would have been even slower. It must have been I must have been two or three stops below ambient here. Now, of course, for those of you that don't know, uh, if the ambient light to get a correct exposure using daylight might have been at a fragment second, might have been a fortieth of a second or a twentieth of a second. Now, because I've exposed at a hundred and sixtieth of a second, therefore it's actually made what daylight is lighting dark, and what we are seeing here at the moment is lit by flash. Mm. And I use this technique quite a bit. Um, let me show you another example of this. Yeah, let me let us just quickly address the question, Dave. I, sure. I I'm not sure if you do food photography, but I I know that you're doing also jewelry, high end jewelry photography. Maybe just tell them what do you use, uh, which light do you use for for jewelry? Okay, so normally that food, is and let you know. Okay, so I would use a much larger source. Some people, some mm -hmm. photographers, even. Um, they, they do a mix of ambient and they would have a large softbox because what they're trying to often imitate is window light. So it's a mm. much larger. So you could use a, I, I'd, I'd probably go to an 8300 and I would put my 85 mm. uh, softbox on. Yeah. Mm. I can imitate light. I can imitate uh, window light with that. Mm. Um, and so that depending on how big the food subject is, you know, if it was a single sort of yeah. item, if I'm doing a small piece of cake, as opposed to a table of food or something like that, you know, but yeah, yeah there's no reason why you can't do that. Uh, you could do the, mm. and, and again with jewelry, it depends on mm. really about what you're lighting and that's always, mm. uh, as important as what you're not lighting. So sometimes you see yeah. those really, you know, you see those really moody sort of pieces there with lots of shadow work and then for argument's sake, the light is only on the wrist of the wrist of the model because they're wearing mm -hmm. some sort of you know ten thousand dollar watch on their wrist or whatever it is and they want you to sort of look that way then mm -hmm. they may have had um a larger light source like a really big soft box like a 15 inch soft box but it's only photographing at a 64th power and then you've got like a little spotlight could even be mm -hmm. something like a like this that's just popping a little, yeah. nice little pop of light on there so yeah. yeah i guess food photography jewelry photography you know um has some similarities there and, and it's always about what you want to light. And I would be going to them and asking about the aesthetic that they're looking for, the lighting that they're looking for. Yeah, you know? another thing is depends on how articulate um, you want the lights. Uh, I mean, if you do want, want to do an Instagram sort of lighting, like David said, mm. you can go, you can get away with 8300, 8200. And even though some people get away with V1, right? Depends on yeah. you're shooting, how, how much light you want to mix with ambient. Um, but with high ends, I know a couple of my friends who are high end fine dining sort of photographers. They use um, mm. lots of times they use LED lights as well, like VL three hundred. So you know you can articulate where each light is falling. Um, mm. You know by four or five lights, even to add some you know small texture with certain areas, stuff like those. So I guess you can start with any light. Um, to break into food photography, then down the road, uh, when you play more with that toy, you you sort of figure your own way out. Um, mm. Yeah. Sure, sure. Mm. Um, here is a piece here. So, uh, I, I, and I guess, you know, on, on this sort of macro scale sort of stuff here, I'm shooting this all with the likes of 8200. 300 is really what I really want to bring, you know, in, in my macro work. That's that's my big boy in macro kind of business, you know. But if I needed something that was a bit smaller, it's either the 200 or you'd even go to a speed like, like a, a, a V1, you know, and a V1's got a whole host of um, modifiers you can put onto it, the round head that has the magnetic clip on. Where you, you can either have barn doors, you can put a dome under it. You, it's got a rubber diffuser that comes out, uh, sorry, a snoot that comes out of it. They've got a great little set of toolkit that, that I also use on the AD200 as well. I use that regularly here uh, on that. But anyway, it's about that. And so here you can sort of see on this shot here, um, very simple sort of piece here. The telltale is that I use that little square soft box. This, this little guy's been all over the place here with me, but there's a catch light there, yeah? And all it is is a drop on the side of a succulent plant. So like a cactus, yeah? Again, in my backyard, I, I often go sort of seeking inspiration in my backyard and, and it just runs down here. and 
again controlling that controlling that light um so and then converting it to black and white and that's sort of i guess both lighting and post-production gives me a certain level of abstraction and when i'm saying abstraction i'm extracting the idea as opposed to being green i'm going to take you to the other one here which you can sort of see here next door very yeah. similar before before we talk into this do you want to yeah answer our mic team sure sure Question? Do you, do you shoot natural lighting with your macro shots, David, direct sunlight, et cetera, or do you prefer? Tim, I, I, uh, so let me see, also using modifiers. It's a little hard to instruct a dragonfly to hold a grey card, indeed. Um, yes, and your white balance, et cetera, or just flash white balance. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Generally, I shoot, Tim, um, generally I shoot flash for my macro. I shoot flashes. No, There's not much that, I mean, you could do it, but, I mean, a lot of my subjects are, are in less than ideal sort of locations. Um, I'm going to show you some that uh, a wasp that was hiding up underneath an awning, a, a, a daddy long leg spider that was hiding in my lounge room kind of business. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, they, they are less than stellar in terms of uh, choosing their location lighting. So I can mimic a lot of lighting with that. Um, and yeah, I guess when I showed you those leaves earlier on, like I showed you that kitchen lighting there, that was just, I mean, great for kitchen lighting bad for macro kind of business yeah so yeah so and that's when you need something that's portable small um to be able to, to be able to get in a place because generally the sub the size of the subject normally that we're looking at in this is um is fairly small so we can use small lights v1 ad 200 ad 300 as i said ad 300 is the big is the big kid on the block i know there's 600s and 1200s and you know but we're not lighting sort of that much sort of stuff so does that answer the question there I mean, ad 300 is fine right it's 1.1 kilo you can easily hold the handhold in, oh absolutely I mean, absolutely yeah. yeah but in terms but, but in terms of the light i can get out of it mate it packs a punch you know for that for that kind of purpose mm. And that's what I'm sort of saying. I'm saying it's my big boy in terms of lighting, not in terms of weight. Of course, you know, you can go to 400s or 600s or 1200s or whatever like that, but we're not here to sort of talk yeah. about those this evening, you know? So, um, yeah. so yeah, so here, here is a similar take to that black and white, but now a color and the, uh, and I think I preferred the black and white, but, um, people who have seen this image here is, um, is certainly, um, certainly interesting this was just a you can see a, it's just a, i can't even think of the name of these plants i take pictures of pretty plants and pretty flowers and pretty insects and all that kind of business though it's funny i i do find uh, things so let's uh, have a look at maybe um some other images here in my backyard so here this is a now it's funny the people that start people start seeing your pictures and then go hey david the plumbago butterflies are around a moth they're actually a moth plumbago and there's actually a little bit of plum or a bit of purple that's showing right here but not very much and uh this was <laughs> this was one of my entries into uh the aipp new south wales awards several years ago it got an 89 so close to gold it was on a gold challenge i can tell you what's wrong with the image as well it's funny many judges are up here but i was a little over hasty in my post-production um and when i say my post-production i was working on the sharpening here and i've got a little little hair like black line that runs around the side here it was a telltale sign it was enough for one of our learned judges in the act to deny me a goal but anyway i forgive you david um <laughs> but anyway the this is a plumbago oh, butterfly fat. found in my yeah cruel you know what it's like aries you played the yeah. you've been in those rounds mate um yeah. So this is a plumbago butterfly. And of course, all the pieces that we enter into our competitions, uh, they must be, they're not captive, they're not they're not dead, they're not whatever, you can't do anything to them. So you've got to find them. So this is one of those things I was talking about before about uh, getting to the dragonfly. Well, this guy has caught, those droplets on his wing are actually the, a really heavy morning dew. So he was actually caught, he, I can't sex the butterfly from here, but, um, the, the, it was caught by the morning dew, so it was captive, it's held captive. And all these little bits, they acted like little like lenses. You can see all the, what we actually call them, they're actually called scales on a butterfly and a moth's wing. But when you touch them, they come off like a really fine powder, but they act like little lenses on the, uh, on the lens, on the wing here. So he was caught. Now I used flash for this again, it would have been something like the equivalent of a V1. I needed this, but you can see I've mixed a lot of ambient in that, but if the if the moth's not leaning quite the right direction, hasn't got quite the right lighting on it, I can't push it in the right direction. I've got to leave it alone and uh, I don't want to disturb the droplets on him. And in compliance with these, you know, I, I take those rules very seriously. Um, 
So I, I just use a bit of fill light on this, you know, uh, it's re really nice and soft. It, it feels enough and I can, I can go and do that. Anyway, um, 89 in my backyard. Um, let's see. So this is a robber fly. Um, and the, it's again, well, it's in my backyard. It's actually in my carport. This is the, the surface that this robber fly is lying on is the roof of my car. So you can imagine sometimes when I am, when I was taking this shot, I was lying on the roof of my car with a, uh, with a soft box attached to a speed light. And um, my neighbors are coming out like, what's he up to again? I mean, I'm, I'm the crazy insect man in my place and business. But what I love about this is I converted this image uh, to black and white. And as soon as you take that into black and white, it starts sort of having a real, to me, it had a real sort of, uh, medieval kind of sort of look to it. You look at all these spurs and barbs on it, but you can see that I've actually lit a game from the left-hand side, the front of the eyes, and letting the light just fall off towards the tail here. Um, and so I think it, I really like that mix in this particular case of ambient and uh, ambient and uh, flash speed light. I mentioned before, here's another one. Now, that's in my, actually in my lounge room. It's actually in the cornice of my lounge room, right up high. Um, I had to go and get a ladder, a step ladder, and my camera and a speed light, and I stood up there, and this is handheld. Um, but this is actually what a daddy long legs looks like. So daddy long legs is a very common spider. In Australia, uh, I don't know about other parts of the world, but daddy long legs is what they're called. And this is what it looks like when you get in nice and close. And check out all those hairs, and I, I, I quite enjoyed the composition so talking I, mean, I mentioned a little bit about composition before in terms of photographing uh, macro is just about as much composition as photographing people or photographing architecture we're always looking for leading lines diagonals something that sort of really is um, appealing here so I, I feel this this is a paper wasp now he's under my back awning of my veranda. He's up nice and high underneath the awning here. But you can see um, he's really giving me the evil eye. I dare, these guys, of course, can sting and they're very, very painful. But you've got to know about when, when, when it's too close. Uh, I haven't got that <laughs> close, but uh, it was close enough. You can see he's looking right down the lens of the camera here. So what a good model there. I know we were talking about before about getting my dragonfly to move. He didn't edit, he was giving me the evil eye and I was um, blasting away there. Uh, so you can see again, check the catch light. You can see that the lighting now is coming from the top right here. Um, yep. But the lighting here, if I was shooting underneath that awning without lighting in ambient, I wouldn't have got anything that looks like this at all kind of business because yep. the rest of the light is falling off here to the white sort of paintwork, and but it's out of focus and it looks like it's almost like a studio shot, yeah? Um, mm. Yeah, so it all started though back i'll take you to this one now this oh. one was actually this one here was a um one of my first gold images at appa um some time ago and uh this is actually a fruit fly this is a little fruit fly and these are strands of spider's web and this was i was walking around in my backyard and you can actually see little pictures of my backyard if you look in these little dew drops you see a little greenery in the dewdrops right here. Yeah. So I do. what I yeah. So that's actually that that's actually vegetation, and the vegetation wasn't that far out the out out, out in the black area out here. But it would have really made the shot really busy. So the lighting now let me simplify simplify the the composition here. Um, yeah. This 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 um, fruit fly was live. He's vibrating on this strand up and down really, really quick, like a, like on a guitar string kind of business. He's trying his darndest to get out of here. And this is a really nice misty day up here in the Blue Mountains. We get some of these nice wet misty day and moody days. And I was just hunting around the backyard again with a the speed light and, a, and, and my camera. And I, I found this guy here and he was vibrating. And I reckon I got about six shots away before he actually, he broke free of the spider's web. So you live to, uh, live to probably uh, go and get into my apples or oranges or something like that, because I say he's a fruit fly. Okay, but it's a happy story. <laughs> happy story, he lived happily ever yeah. after, yes, indeed. Yeah, well, it's probably my breast. You know, I thought <laughs> you were going to tell us a very sad story. Then you get a gold distinction shot with a spider coming in. 
<laughs> it's a um, yeah. it's a yeah, it's a bit of a cliffhanger there. Is but yeah, so again, shooting above ambient, probably three or four stops, uh, uh, you know, above am above ambient exposure. There, I was able to simplify this exposure, and that's why using lighting again gives me control, as opposed to if I shot it with with uh, ambient, of course, I would have had this lots of green foliage in the background. Probably would have been a uh, a uh, you know seventy six next image, please kind of thing. You know, that's a bit of an AIPP joke for those. That means it's not an award image. It's just been uh, nicely done. And thanks very much. Um, that same year, and this was the image that was on the um, on the post that Aries put out to promote. This is a robber fly, and this was actually sitting on my. <laughs> sitting on my back window here and I saw him and I have, I, I often have camera gear sitting out on my breakfast bench, just waiting for something to sort of pop up. And I found this guy, as I said, on my back window and I tried to open my back window very gently and try and photograph this guy, but he, he flew out. And this leaf that he's sitting on here is an agapanther. And if you're in Australia, you, uh, in particular regions, you know that agapanthers grow like wildfire, but they, but they, but nice little stage here. Anyway, he flew off here, but, it was a really hot, humid day, and it was just starting to rain. And you can see here on the top there, four drops. They're actually raindrops. So I'm actually sitting in the rain as it's just about to storm. And this guy didn't want to fly. So again, knowing animal behavior, the insects don't run during the rain. They're, they're trying to lock down a spot short of the predator getting too close, yeah? And you'll see that the little catch light in the raindrops, again, was a um, flash uh, speed light with a small soft box and I'm literally inching in and I take a, take a shot, I, I get closer. So what I do when I'm photographing these guys is I will almost take the safety shot. Do you want to zoom in back. a bit, Dave? Just oh, show us a it. bit more uh, details. Yeah. Ah, gorgeous. So see that? They act like little lenses on the top there. Oh, and I can tell you the story about these guys. So these guys actually fly around and on the wing, they capture bees, like honeybees. They eat honeybees. And what they actually have is they have, this is not a happy story, Aries, so please brace yourself. Um, they have what Sorry, they call a, not here, so yeah, that's fine. <laughs> they have what they call a proboscis, which is like a, basically like a spear that they in, uh, stick into the bee and they insert, yeah. they inject an enzyme, which turns the bee's innards into like a milkshake. And then they suck it out and that's their dinner. And they leave the <laughs> bee and off, the, and off they fly. So, but, <laughs> They make pretty, uh, they make pretty cool subjects, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, but again, a mixture you can see here, a mixture of ambient, and a mixture of, uh, and a mixture of speed light. And I think sometimes you can see that I, I've done some other shops here where I've overridden daylight, and others here where I uh, sort of mix. And that's, um, you know, I, I guess you know the Godox because of course they have, you know, we can shoot up to an eight thousandth of a second with those guys as well. So you know, depending on how much ambient and what the what the ambient exposure is, I mean, that's what's really cool. As opposed to um, and having that much power, saying like even in my AD three hundred, I can I can go a fair way with that. You know, um, yeah. Let's sort of see. So I am going to go along to. What's up, mate? Cheers, mate. Water break. Yeah, yeah. I am talking. Uh, I feel like sometimes I'm calling a uh, calling a race when I'm doing this. Sorry, another question on a bright sunny day. If you achieve, yeah. if your miniature subject is in sunlight, you need to get a creative shot using your flash. Do you use NDs as well? No, Tim. I don't use NDs a lot on that. What I would do is I'd probably if I've got um, part of my gear which I haven't shown you here. Maybe you want to pull back their areas. I can show them one of these. Yeah. This is a Wimberley clamp. And you can see here it's got like, I'm just trying to, it's got like a, a clamping mechanism here on it. Well, I can hold a little uh, diffuser with that, yeah? So you can see that this end here goes onto the leg of my tripod, something like that. It's called a plamp here, like clamp, except with a P and it's got this little uh, screw down here and it um yeah i would hold a diffuser over the top of it so that, that, that's how i would control that light if i had to tim i i, I would put a um, um if i could I'd, i you know but i'm as the sort of said before too in in trying to cross a uh, particularly a, an insect or something like that i would be really careful about putting my shadow across it because shadows sometimes alert them so if it came across really quick 
um, you'd probably spook your subject. But in terms of, but if you're thinking if you were shooting flowers outside or something like that in, in bright sunlight, yeah, and you want to control the lighting, then you could knock your light down with a with a diffuser, something like that. Um, Tri grips, one of my favourite. Um, you know, they've got a little handle on them, um, and you can put handles on, you can put reflectors and different kinds of bits and pieces on them. So that's how I would sort of knock that down. Yeah. Anyway, um, back to the show. So this is a bull ant, and they have a very um, they have what they call a, a, a symbiotic relationship with these these are these here are actually what they call a wattle tick scale so they're actually like a they are sucking the sap out of this out of this little tree but what they do so they're they're not particularly good for the tree but their waste product is a very sugary like substance and bull ants and ants generally like sugar so basically this ant looks after these guys yeah and um and therefore they live in a symbiotic relationship um now the way I got this fellow, I was watching them. I watched their behaviour. They were travelling up and down and they were, they, were, they were on patrol. They're guarding these things. And uh, this is, again, another one of those shots where I have only, it's only a single light over top, but you can see that I've even got a little bit of separation here right along the bottom of the branch here. And so it was large enough where something like a small softbox, again, like this one, I'm hope, geez, I hope God will sell us some of these areas, <laughs> those soft box there, because I use them all over the place. Well, for, for your subject, in relation to the, the, the light source, in subject to the, the relation to the size of the subject, of course, they're very large. So, um, but what I found is that if I accidentally bump the tree, then the ants stop and they give you the evil eye. But if they fall off, they also run up your leg and they give you a bite as well. And make, they can make you dance like no man's business. But, uh, oh. but yes, yes. So anyway, this is one of those things, and this is out. Um, this was shot out at a place called Dunn Swamp, which is over the other side of the Blue Mountains. Um, and again, just going looking in the bush here. Um, let's have a look at this guy. Can you see him? Yeah. Okay. So this is what they call a hawk privet moth. They're a really heavy, heavily felted moth, but the privet is the uh, is the um is the key because um they actually hide on the bark of either privet trees or trees that are near privet privet is a in australia privet is actually a weed um and blue mountains is cursed with those with privet lots of privet but these guys hang close to it and what i really enjoyed here was just finding this so i've actually pulled back this is not tradition this is not macro this would be i'd consider this close up yeah but it falls in that sort of general sort of um and again, I did use a little bit of flash here, but again, here is a balance because I'm just looking to try and fill in these cracks in the tree here and, and around this guy. So it just sort of helped the camouflage, I guess, of this. Here is... Oh, my favourite. Yeah. Okay. This is a... I actually, it's funny, I actually saw this out in my backyard. This is a poor worm that's past his life, and you can see the ants that are breaking it up. It's funny, when people have sort of seen this, they thought that the ants were sort of getting into like a, a jelly snake or something like that, yeah, but it's actually a, a garden worm. But they were dragging it toward their nest, and but it was along a brick footpath. So what I actually did was I was a bit cheeky, and I put a sheet of A4 white paper down in their pathway, and they eventually, uh. they just started dragging it onto that, the very edge of the A4 sheet of paper is right here on the edge here. They got a bit upset and all that kind of business. But you can see these little guys, they're literally breaking up. And um, one light straight over straight over the top there, you can see the little shadows they're casting. This was under a big canopy of ivy, which is by my big shed. So, um, But I liked what I did. Uh, I enjoy that. See these little guys here, again, picking a shutter speed that allows for a little bit of motion blur. So you don't always have to freeze the subject with flash. Flash is really good at doing that, yeah? Um, and in some of those other subjects, like the one that I was talking about with the with the fruit fly, on the like acting like a guitar string, then the, the pulse of the flash was enough to sort of lock in that exposure and can be, you know, a thousandth, two thousand, five thousandths a second. Here, this yeah. is mixing ambient and flash, yeah? And um, it comes along. Yeah, yeah thanks, I was yeah. wondering, what, what did you have? Like, it's almost like a studio shot. How did you, you know, yeah. you, shot, you know, and shot on an app. There, you and two. <laughs> yeah, that's it. 
an A4 sheet of paper. That's how I end that was, mate. You know, big time, big production values here. Yeah. There you go, team. So here's how you, how to get your end hold your great paper, a great card. <laughs> well, there you are. Yeah, that's right. That's Timmy. He was asking about a grey card. I think we can balance off one of those, can't we? Let's have a look. Why don't we take a little bit of a? I'm going to just take a little. Can we go and play? Because yeah, sure. I'm going to go and play. We played Leaf One. Why don't we play Leaf Two there, Aries? Sure. Anything you want, mate. Just give me Thanks, one mate. second. Leaf sure, Two. Leaf go. Two. Yeah. All right. I'm going to have another sip of water. Share screen, tab, leave two. This one? I can't see it yet. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. Okay. So, this was just a, um, that's all right. Let's play this anyway, and I'll, I'll talk them through this. So, this was from the earlier leaf shot um, that shows me uh, hanging, it off of, hanging the leaf off the boom stand and using the snoot um, to top light. So, we mentioned. Uh, uh, when we when we could this, I'll show you the shot there. But I'm top lighting here. You can see I'm actually testing where the light's falling here. I gave it a couple of pops there. I'm just sort of making sure that the light is falling a particular way here. That shot there is actually just a single shot there with the light coming over the top. Here I am about to put a second light together. I'm um, putting the bare bulb in there, and I'm putting the second snoot that comes in that kit there uh, onto the an, another AD200 here. And this is the one where I was going to uh, pop it in. And um, there it is. I mentioned that um, Gorilla Pod before by JB, which I, as I said, they go on back of chairs. I hang them out of trees or whatever like that. They're really handy, particularly for this kind of light stand. Uh, sorry, for this size light, they're really well matched. And so they go on. So, yeah, sorry in answer to the fellow that was asking before about uh, Godox making tripods, you know, but uh, this certainly... Uh, Something does the job there. So you can see, yeah, this is the one that I was talking before about lighting overhead and uh, down the bottom. What I'm actually going to do, Aries, before I show the next one, because I, I actually confused the videos there, I'm going to show um, a couple of little skeleton leaves. I've got one here just out of frame. Excuse me. Yeah. Coming back. And you you heard me mention before, I'm going to hold this close up to camera. This is on, another, this is on an early Wimbley plant. I don't know, this may not focus quite properly, but this is actually a skeleton leaf, okay? But you see how you can't see it through it? You can't see my face? What I've actually painted on this leaf is I've, I mentioned in that earlier leaf mixture before, I mentioned uh, about uh, using uh, glycerin and, and um, yeah, uh, in, in, my, in my formula there. I've painted that leaf with glycerin. Okay, so why don't we actually pay, play the stained video and then we'll show sure. them stained because okay. what I've done here is I actually haven't lit the subject. You'll see that I've actually lit the background and the reason I've called it stained is because I believe we get like a stained glass look. Stained. Stained. This one? Here we go. That's the one. So you can see I've got a sheet of my birthday paper out here, but see that leaf there? I'm actually holding that on a, that is being held just like a little alligator clip that can hold it. You can do that with over that Wembley plant. And now what I'm actually doing is you can see with the snoot, I've, I only want to photograph the actual paper that's behind. I don't know whether, let's just see if our video pulls out here. We'll have a little look because it's looking at some of the stills. We're gonna have a look at those up nice and close. I'll talk you through these here. So you can see my plant that is holding a, a sheet of uh, my birthday paper there. And oh, here I am talking about using extension tubes because we're going to get in nice and close on this too. But all I'm doing is I'm lighting that birthday paper and then I'm shooting the leaf. And the leaf gives us what looks to me like a bit like stained glass. So we'll see. I'm just going to follow this along and I'll show you a couple of these shots here in a minute. But you can see by not lighting the leaf, the leaf actually almost goes to black and I'm shooting through the leaf. And so that colour that's coming through is actually the lit birthday paper. So if you want to then change the colour just a little bit of what you're sort of seeing, just move your birthday paper a little bit because my birthday paper had all nice colourful stripes on it. So, of course, mm -hmm. we're seeing some yellow stripe, blue stripe, red stripe here. But twist it, tilt it, whatever it is, you know, so it comes right through there. So if we go to my screen there, Aries. Yeah. 
here we go oh nice so see that now you can see here this is the giveaway here that this is the out of focus paper here and you can even see here that uh what if i zoom in you can see that a couple of the cells here didn't take the glycerin there straight away but we can see all these little cells so i've lit the paper but i'm actually photographing the leaf and so the veins the skeleton when the leaf turns black so when i popped on uh, you saw me waving around there my set of extension tubes i decided to pop those on because i wanted to get in closer to one of these sections and oh, where'd we go there so did you what, what did you do you um you lit up the um your birthday paper yeah so i put the birthday only, paper only with on. one light or yeah because, only with um, one light only with one light oh cool so what did i so what was it that he painted the leaf with it was glycerin mm. glycerin cheryl thompson's asking there so glycerins are used in cake baking yeah and mm. yeah i can see john swainson enjoying our my cathedral like sort of thing john swainson down there in that know his work go and check out his cathedral stuff awesome um but anyway mm. back to the back to here so so the so the leaf is not actually lit the leaf is not lit. All I'm doing is photographing the little glycerin cells behind, which is the birthday paper, which gives me the color. So here's another example of it. And we can see here, I'm gonna zoom back out here. Now we can see here that what I actually uh, did here, the leaf is not parallel to the sensor. And the way I know that is because my focus falls in and out. So if we look here, focus out, is not sharp is sharp look at all that nice little that juicy texture right in there and then we come up here but sometimes of course we use the falling out of focus to direct our vision as well you know because we look because we naturally look for contrast we look for color we look for so we're looking for contrast here we've got black against color we've got focus that happens out here and we've yeah so all these kinds of things so so yeah so um if you're looking for these kinds of leaves, as I mean, I find this, I didn't actually find in the garden. You can actually find these at like craft shops and things like that. They use these in um, scrapbooking and stuff like that. You jump on some of your favorite auction house online sites there and look up skeleton leaf or something like that. You'll find, you'll find some colored ones or whatever like that. I tend to go for the naturally sort of colored ones and glycerins like $2 tube or something like that at the in your cake baking section there and a, and a little soft brush so yeah go, go and paint them here's a tip too that i i have tried all different kinds of papers that i lit behind um mm -hmm. and generally the more colorful the paper the better the result so you'll notice well in that there i don't have that paper here handy but i do have something here that would be very good for it excuse me no take your time <laughs> no, I could see something there, areas that I would use for it. See that lid? Uh, give me a sec. See Let me uh, enlarge you. Sure. So see how colourful that is there, guys? I, I, I tried something that also had a fair bit of white and stuff in it, and white coming through that leaf didn't do, wasn't anywhere near as, for me, wasn't as exciting, you know? But, mate, there was a 75-cent sheet of wrapping paper from the local discount store or whatever it was, you know? and look at what you can create yeah um this is just one of those things and this is what I, I was trying to turn my head a little bit when i was thinking i've showed you some leaves i've showed you some skeleton leaves etc and i'm showing you what i can find around my backyard of course i mean in new south wales fortunately we're sort of fairly we've been fairly blessed as far as our current covid situation but some of our friends you know interstate and around the world are working from home or you know confined to barracks as we might call it and so these are lots of little subjects that you can sort of go and play with go and get creative with this is really important to keep those creative juices flowing you know this is just sort of we've, we don't let our mojo dry up so to speak you know so yeah but anyway i i that, that that's a that's um yeah a good little one the, the bubbles that we had a look at there i'm just having a look for what else we um got here okay so let me take you to i'm just having a little look here Oh, before I remember this, I also I also grabbed this one because I was just thinking about, um, yeah, okay, they're out of order here a little bit. If we go and play the fruit video, I'm going to show you a couple sure. of fruit shots, but I can show them what you can actually do with this. This fruit, this fruit stuff's okay, you know, but I want to show you just to give you an idea of the setup, what you can do, and I'll I'll show you what can be done 
Um, it was funny, the, um, the, sam the samples that were available at the particular time weren't particularly crash hot, but it gives you an idea of how simple this setup is here. So it's all my fault, Dave. I um I kind of dragged this too long. So we're supposed okay. to do that in the summer. And sure, sudden, no, 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 that's yeah. a yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah it's no, my fault, but, Dave. I apologize. No, it's all right, Aries. It's just one of those things where, you know, uh summer is now coming again, you know, so I get all excited. The flowers are starting to so look at the snoot here again. I've cut off a slice of kiwi fruit there and I'm backlighting it. Uh backlighting it here, and we can sort of see the the colours that come through here. And I don't know whether our video, okay, the video didn't show it here, but I'll show them the photo. So if you go back to my screen there, Aries. Sure. Okay, so there's the kiwi fruit. Um, I've seen people try tomatoes, I tried an orange. Here's one that I did on that day, which is a bit so-so, but this is, this is uh, a sample. I'll show you a good one of these, which I did several years ago, but same subject mm. so that is a backlit oyster mushroom oh so before it disappears into your evening meal excuse me honey i'm going to borrow the food before i uh, toss it through the wok or whatever it is and put a bit of oyster sauce on it or something like that you know oyster in sauce or something like um that is a backlit oyster mushroom again a single light coming from behind mm um i can shoot it warm and then i can even just go and play with the color balance in post-production yeah and change mm -hmm. it up there but uh this is what it's you can easy how a single i could do right yeah yeah but you think about the back of an oyster mushroom like i'm shooting something that's only the size of you know three four five centimeters whatever it is you can when you're next in the supermarket there go and grab some oyster mushrooms and have a look at those gills i'm sure there's plenty of us out there that have uh been playing with that. I've been seeing some abstract creations by some of my fellow photographers here at the AIPP, and I'm sure they're playing with mushrooms at the moment, you know. So, but uh, but anyway, that's the uh, that's yeah, oyster mushrooms. Go and slice a piece of orange. Go and try, um, as I said, kiwi fruit, and then afterwards, go and eat it all. <laughs> you can go and have your go and have your meal there. I'm just sort of seeing if we're sort of going along there. How are we going there, Aries? Any more questions there at the moment, or are we still uh, just fine? Oh, we're well, all fine. Um, okay, cool. Well, let's let's talk. I think Bruce uh, was saying that you have a super cute snooze. I'm Bruce, <laughs> are you thinking the same thing I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, I don't know yeah. what to, I don't want to know what you guys are thinking. You know, so yeah. oh, okay, cool. <laughs> um, so this little fella, if you recognise the. I don't know if you can see the texture here. This is sitting on my breakfast bench. I live in the mountains here. These little critters that sometimes get in there. But before we uh, dispose of this little guy, you know, and when I say dispose, I'm the kind of person who I'm not getting out the bug spray. I'm getting a glass and a sheet of paper. I'm capturing them and I release them outside. These, these are my friends, these guys, you know. Um, but yes, caught on the caught on the kitchen bench. So look at the, you can see the pattern underneath here. That's Caesar stone or something like your kitchen bench. Look at that little square rectangular sign again, the catch light, the all important catch light. Again, a, a V1 uh, or the likes uh, with that. And then taking uh, to black and white, here's one of his mates who's outside in the garden. Look at this little guy. Single light, because often when I'm hunting around in the garden, I've got camera in one hand and light in the other, you know, um, mm. if not this. So these are all. So is, all, this, uh, all... is this microplast extension cube as well? Uh, no, that's just a straight. That's just a straight, um, straight macro lens, Aries. Um, yeah. So only macro lens. That's some of the benefit of shooting. Like as I said, I shoot a Nikon D850, and that's forty-six megapixel. So it gives mm -hmm. me a lot of croppability in, into those frames. Okay. You know, um, I did come off a twenty megapixel something beforehand, and of course, uh, lower and lower. Here's, a, here's an interesting story on this one. Um, so from shooting other bits and pieces, uh, that so bits and pieces, butterflies, people that are really into butterflies then come along and start telling you about where are the butterflies, where you can find them. And I actually photographed these. Yeah, you can tell there are two butterflies there um, making more butterflies. Um, this was actually photographed in the local cemetery. So somebody was down there, had known that this, 
uh, what they call swallowtail butterflies. They're little tails down here, um, swallowtail butterflies. And fortunately, there was a funeral happening, but way over the other side of the cemetery, I wasn't bothering anybody. And these guys would fall out. And this, this one here, this butterfly here on the right, is fresh out of the chrysalis, literally just hatched only moments beforehand, had fallen to the floor of the, the ground, and it had crawled up this stick here to dry itself. This other one here that's looking a whole lot tatty, I believe it's probably at the toward the end of its life, but had a mission to sort of help make more butterflies again. And two became one here. And it's interesting because some people have sort of seen the shot and thought, oh, that's a nice picture of a butterfly. But then they sort of see two butterflies making more butterflies. This <laughs> again was shot with flash because I am yeah. lying here on the ground. I'm, this is a ground, I am on my stomach here and it would have been good to have a bit of behind the scenes footage here, Aries, you know, but yeah. I was um, lying on my stomach, again, light in hand here, but I shot it because I like to play with their the little swallowtails here because that's a really sort of telltale characteristic of these particular butterflies. So I can shoot it slow enough where their little tails move, but I got this kind of detail here. And it's all, it's all over the place, you know, So and people start sort of telling you about all kinds of, bits and pieces and where, where, where you can find them. And so that's why it's sometimes good to sort of um, show your work and then people will start bringing it. So the same lady that told me about these introduced me to this guy. You can see I've actually got my mark on this from a few years ago. Mm. So um, some people have thought that this looks a bit like a, a um, like an alien or something like that. It could have been where, yeah. where's Sigourney, where's Sigourney Weaver or something like that. Where's she going to take care of you know this uh, this bug? But all it is, it's a butterfly chrysalis hanging on the side of an oleander leaf. Um, but using those techniques of abstracting down, getting rid of the ambient daylight. This was in her garden. This little thing was just sort of uh, uh, incubating in her garden. But I thought by taking it to black and white by taking it to getting rid of the the background again we could uh we could um abstract it out um i think that was probably a um probably a silver in, in uh, at apples if i remember rightly but it's back 2016 so it's a little while ago so what i would suggest um is for people that i mean obviously we've, we've got a range of expertise in our audience there tonight mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. i can actually see somebody saying they use gamella flour mixed with soap i hope everybody else has seen those those tips there i mean oh, there's all these mixtures i'll have to go and read those comments afterwards there um mm -hmm. but yeah sure. it's a it, it's it, it's it's about um being out there giving it a whirl and, and just getting a getting a getting a start to sort of play so i think we've been through you know a, a um pretty much everything a bucket load of images there i was going to have a little yeah. look sorry yeah how are we doing there Sorry, I just need a mouthful great. of water. Um, we had a lot of tips with the lightings as well as all the nice accessories uh, you share with us about, you know, back lead, front lead, as well as the foliage, as well as the bugs, how to you do the bug whisperer. <laughs> bug whisperer, <laughs> I, like, I like that word. And your super cute snoots, of course, like Bruce <laughs> Moyer said, don't blame me. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we appreciate you, um, Devo, and uh, thank you for your time. And guys, if there's no further question, we will call it for the day. And um, thank you, Devi, and um, I You're will welcome, see you Gary. guys. Maybe let's just see you guys until next week. David, do you want to share with us your uh, personal websites and um, so people can sure. follow you on Instagram? And sure. So on on Instagram, I'm just uh, David Glazebrook. It's easy that to find, and my website is dgp so d for david g for glazebrook do you want to message me so i can sure i can i can i can text over there yeah dgp.co yeah. easy enough but i'll send it to areas and areas will post it up there and if you want to have a I look at that, you'll find a lot of those the, images the, all the sure that'll be easier yep and instagram you'll find you'll see a lot of these images so if you want to go back and have a look again or you didn't get to look at it long enough then uh, yep. they're all out there yeah yeah cool excellent all right and, Thank you all. Thank you for thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much for your time, your, uh, your time. All right. no, you're very I'll welcome. See you guys, guys. Uh, next week. Okay. Good night.